planning application fees have gone up significantly, 35%. So if you're not aware of that, have a look at it. Right, <clears throat> lots of people talk about PDR, <laughs> permitted development rights. And everybody goes, oh yeah, you can do it under permitted development rights. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, swear to God, I'm gonna strangle somebody in central government because they need to stop calling it permitted development. Everybody here is permitted and goes, oh, I can do it. No, you can't. It's not, there is still some permitted development out there. What is that noise? Yeah. Fire alarm. Fire, oh, right, okay. Um, there are still some, I'm sure you all know, being seasoned property peeps, a single dwelling house can be converted to a small HMO, house in multiple occupation under permitted development rights, yes? Three, between three and six tenants. Doesn't need planning permission, provided that all of the lovely councils around here do not have an Article 4 direction in place. Now, the number of people that come to me and say, oh, well, of course, Article 4 directions were brought in because of HMOs, weren't they? Bullshit. Sorry, again, actually, no, I don't care. It's bullshit. <laughs> Article 4 directions is the power to local authorities to remove permitted development rights. It has been going for decades. Article 4 has been there for decades in the principal planning legislation. So it's nothing to do with, oh, it's just for it. If you go and put Article 4 direction in a council's website, it will come up with loads of conservation areas. It might come up with some estates. It's not just going to be HMO, so do not think that. The other myth that I need to bust, if we are into myth busting, is when you get an HMO and when you set up an HMO, it is about the number of tenants. So if you have a big, you know, there's lots of around Birmingham, big sort of Victorian villa type thing, and you convert this, and you've got two of the rooms are rather big, and they've got a sofa and they're quite she-she and they've been staged and dressed and it's all lovely. Um, and you've got a double bed in there and a couple come along and you've got six bedrooms in that property and a couple come along and they want to take that one HMO room. I know it's rare to have couples to, to uh, inhabit and, and be tenants of HMOs. But it does happen. So if you come along, you now have seven tenants in your HMO. You need planning permission. Some people are going to be going, oh dear. <laughs> you need planning permission. It's about the number of tenants. It's not about, the people talk about, I've got a six bed HMO. Please start saying six person HMO. If you've got a seven-person HMO, where's your planning permission? Okay? Permitted development rights. Stop calling them permitted. Like six beds and persons. No. Permitted development rights, in my view, and it's just my view, and all of these views that I will expound here are all my views. I don't have to kowtow to any boss. Yes. Right. So. They are wolf in sheep's clothing. And people have looked at this picture and gone, Linda, what's that? It's a wolf in a sheep's coat. Good sake. I love this picture. I think it's fab. Because the prior approval procedure, which is what you are going to have to do for your permitted development rights, they're not. You have to submit a planning application to the council. It is called getting and obtaining the prior approval of the council. Now, I've just said prior approval. It does what it says on the tin. Somebody came to me the other day and said, oh, I want you to help me with this commercial to residential change of use. I do lots of these. I quite like them because they've got niggly little twisty things that come back and bite you in the bum if you're not careful. And I said, all right, okay. I said, um, what is it? It's an office, brilliant. It's class E, perfect. Uh, he said, I've already converted the top floor. I said, pardon? 
oh, okay. I said, so it's full planning permission. No, 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 no. It's permitted development rights. <sighs> I love it when people argue with me. They can argue with me till uh, you know about accountancy because they'll win hands down. But planning, mm, no. Um, so I said, well, you've started, you've commenced development. Yeah, but the rest of the floors I want to do, you can't. It's the building prior approval. You have to get the approval of the council prior to starting work. If that's the only thing you take away from this meeting and my talk here today, remember it. Well, I'm hoping there's a few other little nuggets, but you never know. So, prior approval procedure. It was a big, sexy issue in 2013. Oh my God, that's 10 years. 10 years ago, when it first came in, big, sexy issue. People were taking office buildings and converting them into, quite frankly, slums of the future. Because a lot of these buildings were not fit for purpose, and this is why there is legislation now to allow you to demolish office buildings and rebuild on the same footprint. <sighs> so, if you want to take, there's all sorts of, I haven't got time to do it here, uh, there's all sorts of possible prior approval procedures. You now have to do all sorts of things, flood risk, land contamination, noise externally that might affect your internal tenants, that has I have had one application refused on that basis because there were extractor flues and fans in restaurants next door and the council said, no, we're not having that. That'll be detrimental to the residents. <gasps> really? Nobody's ever bothered with noise before, but pff, damn it. So, all sorts of things. Transport and highways impacts. There is one if it's over eight storeys. And because of the Grenfell issue, you have to indicate fire safety. So can you see with all of these things, it is not just, well, it's permitted development. I could just go ahead and do it. No, it's a prior approval. And the prior approval procedure now has a massive, massive amount of information that needs to be submitted with the application. And do not think it's a rubber stamp job. Because it's not. Loads of these things get refused. Mainly they get refused because insufficient levels of information are submitted. And then people come to me and say, oh, approve it, it's been refused. What's, why has it been refused? Let me have a look at the reasons. Insufficient information submitted. Get on your bike. The planning inspectorate's going to laugh me out of court. No, I'm not doing that. If you've not submitted the right amount of information, get the information together resubmit. Oh, and by the way, now that the fees have gone up, you can't have a free go. You used to be able to have a free go if it was submitted within 12 months. If you've had an application that's been refused or withdrawn before the 6th of December, for the 12 months preceding the 6th of December, you can still have a free go, but it's eventually it's going to peter out. Right. Right. What I talk about here is just for England. Scotland, entirely different system, really. Wales, similar, but no permitted development rights for HMOs. So if you go across the border into Wales, eh, eh, no permitted development rights for HMOs. They all need planning permission, and, and most of them get refused. Um, there is going to be, this week, so Michael Gove says, he announced to a select committee um, last week, and said the new national planning policy framework is going to be published this week. Now, will that have an immediate effect on you as property investors? Probably not. It's going to be the higher level local plans and how local plans are done, but it's also going to, to a certain extent, prevent development on Greenbelt, even the large scale development on Greenbelt. Um, by various means. I can't go into here, I've not got time. So, National Planning Policy Framework, there will be an announcement about that, I suspect, this week. <laughs> <coughs> is it just me that Michael Gove looks like Joel 90? Is it, is it just me? Anyway, Michael Gove. I've got pictures of him standing with banners saying, no development on the green bunch. <laughs> You're thinking, you're the environment, well, levelling up and regenerating. Oh, for God's sake. 
Anyway, so Michael Gove sent a letter out to all, all of the councils um, back in end of October, basically saying everything that was going to be put in the new Leveling Up and Regeneration Act. Bit naughty, really, because it hadn't received royal assent and hadn't been finalised. But he sent this letter and said, oh, we're going to do this. Fees are going to go up. We're going to digitise planning. We're going to do this. We're going to improve that. And I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is about the fifth or sixth time I've heard this in my career. So, oh, no. Oh! You know, no, I wish I'd known. I'd have brought me on. Oh. Right. This man. Jezza, Jeremy Hunt, in the autumn statement. Can you see? Oh, you're looking. Oh, okay. um, in the autumn statement said, and somebody's already asked me about this, you're going to be able to split a house into two. Yeah? You're going to be able to split a house into, I don't know, if, if it's a big enough house and it's wide enough, you'll be able to split it that way or you'll be, it's, predominantly it's going to be flat. Now, people have got very excited about this. <laughs> you had Simon Zucci from PIN on the phone to me the other day saying, oh, Lindsay, you're going to be able to split houses into flats. I'm thinking, he's doing a webinar, isn't he? He's doing a video. <laughs> <laughs> he's doing a bloody video and he wants me. So, yeah, I spent half an hour on the phone and I'm thinking, so I said to him at the end, I said, when are you doing the video? And he went, oh, next week. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. So, Yes, you're going to be able to split a house into two. And everybody's got very excited, including Simon Zucci, saying, oh, it's going to be permitted development. Well, as we now know, sheep, wolf's clothing, is it permitted development? I seriously doubt it because at the moment we have a minimum <laughs> space standard for properties, which is the nationally described space standard, 39 square metres or 37 square metres, if you've got a shower room, not a full bathroom. So if they are going to adhere to that, this cannot possibly be full permitted development. It is going to have to be a prior approval application. Yeah? And there's going to be hundreds of these going into the councils that are already been deluged by applications before the fees went up. So if you were wanting to put one, if it comes in quickly, if you want to put one of these in, don't expect to get a decision before six months is out. So that's Mr. Hunt. What's lurb? I couldn't resist a picture of Tina, the goddess. Um, because on social media, myself and some of the planning geeks, and you've got planning geek, Ian Wormsley, excuse me, what's he doing on here? <laughs> After me, how very dare. <sighs> so, me and planning geeks on social media, the solicitors and planning solicitors and barristers and planning consultants have all been going, what's lurb got to do with it? And we've been thinking we're all so clever and so funny, and we're not really, it's just sad. So. The levelling up and regeneration bill has now received royal assent. It received royal assent on the 26th of October. Is that going to have any direct impact on your day-to-day -day lives? Probably not, but over the next few years, it might have. So it's the Levelling Up and Regeneration Act. Unfortunately, Whitehall didn't take the opportunity to consolidate all of the acts. So we've still got the 1990 acts and we've still got the 1990 Compensation Act and we've still got all of the wildlife acts. They've not lumped them all together, which I would have done, but was probably, was probably gonna kill people's brain cells. So um, Leveling Up and Regeneration Act. The Lura, it is just a framework. It's a massive, there's 100, if you are, if you suffer from insomnia, 357 pages. <clears throat> so I've only got, I've not got past the first couple of chapters. <laughs> um, it's a framework. There will be shed loads of legislation to be hung off this in the next at least two or three years, but also they're gonna be doing community infrastructure levy. That's gonna take 10 years to bed in. I could be dead by then. Right. 
You, <laughs> you just said five minutes. Ha! Right. It's going to mean you can... It's going to mean you can get quicker local plans. I thought, oh, good. Quicker local plans. 30-month local plan time. That's two and a half years. What's quicker about that? So, you know, this whole business of speeding up the planning system, don't hold your breath. Design codes. Design codes are going to be brought in, have to be brought in by each council. Powers to refuse to determine. The council are going to be given powers, or are given powers in the new act, to refuse to even deal with planning applications from major, it's major developers who are time wasters. And they've submitted applications and they've never built them or they've gone somewhere else and they've not bothered with them. They've also, if there is slow or absolutely no development, again, the council, there's going to be things like completion reports. So it's, it's going to be highly restricted. Then there's also, if you've got, if you want to change something, at the moment you used to be able to just submit a letter and you could change little tweaks with development, generally for the larger developments, changing house types and things like that. Um, now there is going to be a section 73B where you can literally have a plan B and you can, it should be a simplified process but to be honest, <laughs> I'm a cynical old witch. And, and when people say oh, it's going to be streamlined and simplified, and I think, no, it's not. You're lying to me. Focus on Brownfield land. I'm sorry. I thought we were already doing that. What's new about that? Infrastructure levy. There is going to be a new infrastructure levy. My view is that this is going to take 10 years to bed in. Currently, we have Section 106 agreements and we have the Community Infrastructure Levy, which is basically blackmail. It means if you want planning permission for that, you're going to give us that. There's no easier way of saying it is blackmail. But currently, the Section 106 agreement system works. And now they're going to bring in this infrastructure levy, combine everything together. And I foresee disaster, to be honest. I might retire. Oh no, who am I kidding? I've no money. I've got two ex-husbands to pay. Right. <laughs> Enforcement notices. Currently, they're called the four-year rule. They're now extending, and if you can get away with something for four years, the council can no longer enforce. Guess what? It's now 10. So loads of these people that come to me and say, oh, well, I'm just going to do it, and then in four years, I'll apply for a certificate of lawfulness. No, it's 10 years. So if you're on year three and a half, and you're thinking you've got, no, 10 years. So digitise the planning system, which, to be perfectly honest, is long overdue. Um, planners and councillors are still blaming COVID for not being able to do this, that, and the other. It's going to be digitised, and part of that digitisation is hybrid meetings. This was a massive argument between the Commons and the Lords about whether, in uh, obviously in lockdown, I've done loads of presentations to committees via Zoom and Teams, and it, it seemed to work quite well. But they were trying to prevent that and make you be present in the room. But actually, there is now going to be electronic presentation capable, and so there's going to be hybrid meetings. So what next? It being the season, the Community uh, the Leveling Up and Regeneration Act is the bare tree. And it being Christmas, all of these decorations are all of the supplementary legislation that needs to go on that tree and hang from that framework. Yeah, so there's lots still to, to go. There's still these consultations coming out. Uh, but nothing yet for the splitting a house into two. And then, on the horizon, we've got a general election. So, if Keir Starmer gets his hands on it, <laughs> that tree is going to look like the Sycamore Gap tree that's no longer there. And it's, it's going to be start again. 
go back to go, do not receive 200 quid. Um, that's me, Linda Wright. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that helped. <laughs>